what is and what should never be. Led Zeppelin. Great song off their second album. And to me, this really showcases um, the talents, well, of all four band members, but in particular, John Paul Jones on the bass and Jimmy Page on the guitar. And the reason why I say that is this. It's evident that these guys, well, it's well known that they were first call studio musicians uh, in England before Led Zeppelin was formed. And um, they got to play on so many different records with different bands and different styles and things, different artists. And apart from that, you know, they both had, you know, pretty interesting musical backgrounds. Um, You can hear a lot of their influences in the music. On this tune, I'm hearing a little bit of a jazz influence, particularly with the chord voicings that Jimmy Page plays. So I'll explain what I mean by that. So we start out, we basically have a two chord vamp. And the chords are this, um, E9 and an A13. Okay, But the song, <laughs> the way the arrangement is, you, you think it starts on the A chord and then goes A, E, A, E. No, it, it, it actually is the E chord that starts. It's just that there's a vocal lead in. And if I say to you, and then the bass comes in, and then there's the downbeat of the A. But that is implying that that E9 uh, chord is it. If I say to you tomorrow. Right, so the downbeat was actually where the vocal comes in. Anyway, it's just a two chord vamp. And another reason I say that it's formed that way is that this is just a common sort of chord progression. Um, Maybe it's a lot less common these days. And maybe it wasn't that common in rock at the time. But in blues and in jazz, it was super common. You know, it it was just one of those things that you could just jam on. Um, And usually those things are voiced like this. Um, Those we call those closed position chords because they're bar chords. We'll talk about that in a second. So let's talk about the terminology of what I said the chords were, E9. So that's a dominant seventh chord with the ninth added to it. Let's check it out. So here's the root E. Here's the third G sharp. Here's the seventh. The dominant seventh, which is D natural. Here's the ninth, F sharp. That's nine notes away from where that E was. Here's an octave. Here's a nine. Okay. So it's four notes. And you might say, okay, but the, the fifth is not in the chord. Right, and it doesn't have to be. When you have any kind of major chord, minor chord, dominant seven chord, it's not necessary to put the fifth in. I'm talking about jazz language now, blues kind of thing. Um, In rock, because there's so many power chords and open major and minor chords, the fifths are always in there. And it's one of the things that makes rock guitar playing sound like it, apart from the overdriven sounds and so forth. But there's always a fifth in the chord, generally speaking. Uh, Not the case so much in in jazz. Okay. Anyway, so that was the voicing for the E9. E, G sharp, D, F sharp. Okay. That same voicing will work on the piano, by the way. You can do the same thing. Let's talk about the A13. Okay, so what do we have here? We've got an E, we've got a G, we've got a C sharp, and we've got an F sharp. So you might say, well, where's the A? The A is not on it. So that's another concept for chord voicings in jazz. That's something called rootless chord voicings. 
meaning the root's not in it. And then you say, well, how is it a chord if the root's not in it? Because the bass is playing the root. Generally speaking, at least on this tune he is. He's, John Paul Jones is playing the A. So clearly that's implying the A13 sound. So what do we have here? We have the fifth of A, which is an E. You might say, you just said you don't need the fifth of the chord. Right, but hold on a second. There's the fifth. G is, is the dominant seven of A. C sharp is the major third. And F sharp is the 13. The 13, that's 13 notes away from that low A note. It's also the same thing as saying the sixth. If you have, see, A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp. One, two, three, four, five, six. The sixth and the thirteenth are the exact same thing. The thirteenth is an octave higher. Let's get back to the thing about how I said you don't need the fifth in there. Well, there's also something called voice leading that you use a lot, well, in music in general, but certainly when we're talking about uh, chord voicings, voice leading is important. And there's the concept of common tones. When you have a chord progression, if you can keep, this is of course not always the case, but if you can keep some of the notes that are common to each chord in the same register, it's going to give you a smoother sound, right? So let's see what I mean by that. If the first chord is an E9, are there any notes that are common between E9 and A13? Yeah, that E note and that F sharp note. So the only two notes that are moving between the two is that the D moves to a C sharp, half step lower, and then the G sharp moves to a G natural, a half step lower. So on an E chord, if the D is the seventh, and then on an A chord, if the C sharp is the third, you see that half step movement? This is super common in jazz piano voicings. That particular thing, the seventh, moving to the third between the two chords. The seventh of one chord moving to the third of the next chord by a half step. Also, the third of one chord moving to the seventh of the other chord by a half step, right? So what, what happened here? Um, I had a G sharp and a D on the E9 chord, right? What do I do? I move a half step down to C sharp and G for the A chord. That's the sound of the song right there. I mean, the sound of the chord progression anyway. And, and if you if you know anything about jazz, you'll hear you'll know this. It, it's the first two chords of a blues and lots of tunes that are written based off the blues, right? So you have the one chord, which is an E, let's just call it E7. Four chord, A7, back to one chord. Five. So did you see what I did there? When I, I was on the E7 chord, I need the five chord now. So all I did is I moved up the D to a D sharp. So this would be a B7 chord now, right? And I moved the G sharp up to an A. Again, third and seventh. When you do just those two notes, just the third and the seventh of a chord, that's the sound of a dominant seventh chord in, in jazz. Okay, um, Whatever instrument it is, piano or guitar, that's playing chords. Even if you have a horn section, the notes are going to be arranged that way, right? Okay, I know we're getting away from what is and what should never be. Coming back to it, but I wanted to show you why those things are that. And so, 
Whether it was through blues or jazz, Jimmy Page was aware of these voicings. Now, he's utilizing some open strings there to, to great effect, but there's an easier way to do this if you just play bar chords. So I, 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 I hinted on it before. So an E9 closed can be this. E, G sharp, D, F sharp. It's the exact same voicing as here, right? It's the same order of notes. That's a, that's a hard fingering to do. This is a much easier fingering. Because it's close together and then the fingers are just all straight across the fingerboard. For an A13, what you would do is something like this. All right, so now that's a little bit different. Let's see what we've got here. We've got the root, A, E, th uh, the seventh, G, C sharp is the third, and there's that 13, F sharp. But if I wanted to kind of keep the voicing consistent with this thing, all I'd have to do is not play the A note. I'd still keep the same shape, but I'd just take the pick and start it on the fifth string instead. E, G, C sharp, F sharp. Isn't that the same thing as this? E, G, C sharp, F sharp. It's the same notes. So, you know, for a pretty straightforward rock tune, there's some interesting harmony in there that you can use for other things. And that, that's why, I mean, it's a cool tune, but it's worth your time to sort of check out what those chords are and how to use it in other contexts. Let's check out what John Paul Jones is playing on the bass. All right, so John Paul Jones comes in on the downbeat of four in the first measure. One, two, three. <laughs> Alright, so let's take a look at that line. After the slide of the root note E on the E9 chord on beat 4, he's going to slide up into an A for the A13 chord. Look at the notes he's playing here. A, E, F sharp, A, F sharp, E, A. So what is that? major pentatonic, right? But you see how those notes are part of the chord voicing. Root, fifth, thirteen. Thirteen is the same as the six, remember? Okay. And then what? A to C sharp. All right, here we are. We're on the E9 chord now. Here's the root note. Okay. B, C sharp, E, C sharp, B. What's that in relation to the E chord? Root, fifth, sixth, or 13. Root. It's the same collection of notes, right? Major pentatonic. I did it on the A. I'll do it on the E. But he's not playing the thirds of the chords. Those two lines sound dramatically different from each other on each chord. But they're essentially the same thing. It's just that the register is different. Look, here, the A was here at the higher register, right? And then he comes down to the fifth. Then you have that rhythmic pattern, too. Here, he started the E on this register and then went up to the fifth. And there's a little rhythmic pattern there. If I did each one the same way, he could have done that, but that's nowhere near as interesting as what he did do. 
And then he, he lands on that B, right? It's the fifth of the E chord. And he's giving it some vibrato there. That's a nice touch, you know, to really let the note sing out. Um, but why? Why emphasize that note? Look at the melodic part of it. And then, so it's a whole step down to get back to the A note. All right. Okay, so what's some of the takeaways here? Well, one of the things, if you're ever playing just a two chord vamp, that's like a E9 to an A13, you can use the notes of the major pentatonic scale. Right, because most bass players, we, we think, okay, roots, we gotta play the roots, which is true. Um, we think we've gotta arpeggiate the chords. Sometimes, yeah, you, you want to arpeggiate the chords for sure, but not always. Um, it's amazing what you can get out of something simple like the major pentatonic scale um, against some kind of dominant seven chord because you're not playing the dominant seven. If, it, if it's an A seven chord, right? That's the arpeggio. But if I played major pentatonic, I'm leaving out that dominant seven note. If you listen to great blues bass players, okay, and if you learn any of their lines, it's funny how few sevenths they actually play in their bass lines against the chords on like a 12 bar blues. I'm not saying that they're not in there, and it does depend on the line, but there's a, a dramatically different effect of, let's say, um, a, a swinging kind of shuffle bass line, uh, key of E, uh, one, two, three, four. So, all right. At no point did I play a seventh on any of those chords, not one. And, and that's a classic blues bass line that you would play on a, on a shuffle. But there are other kinds of bass lines that you would play it on. Um, for example, one of these things, uh, three, four. Now it, w it was all root fifth and seven, right? That sounds great too, but the first one without the seventh was just more open sounded. And this one is like a little meaner sound, you know, a little dirtier, greasier sounding to my ear. But uh, think of what is and what should never be. Think of the mood that tune sets up. It's about as chill as Led Zeppelin ever was with an electric tune, right? I'm not talking about their acoustic stuff. Um, and if he had played the sevenths, even though they are dominant seventh chords, maybe that wouldn't have fit the mood of the song, right? Good to have options either way. Check it out. Well, I hope you enjoyed that breakdown. Uh, if you did, please consider subscribing to my channel and there'll be more videos like this to come. Thanks for watching.